Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Bobby I'm an alcoholic. I'd like to thank the committee for inviting me. Jerry invited me a number of months back, and uh, my contact since then has really been Judy, but I'd like to thank the entire committee because obviously it takes a large group to pull off. Uh, this has been incredible. I mean, I feel like I'm in God's country. I mean, I actually live five minutes from Independence Hall, and so I'm in the heart of the city. So I really admire the beauty here of your beautiful state. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, chapter 5 of the big book is real clear. I'm supposed to tell you in a general way what my life was as an active alcoholic, what happened to me, and what my life is like today as a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. My sobriety date is June 2nd, 1988. My home group is the underground group. Uh, we meet at the Old Pine Community Center, 4th and Lombard in South Philadelphia, three nights a week, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays at 8 o'clock. If you're ever in the neighborhood, please stop by. We'd love to have you. We'll go out for cheesesteaks afterwards. <laughs> Real cheesesteaks, please don't eat them anywhere else. You're going to come to Philly. Uh, can everybody hear me? Okay. No? How's that? So I never had a problem getting a drink in a crowded bar, so I want to make sure everybody hears me. As far as any perceived accent you may think I have, that's on you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was born and uh, raised in a very blue-collar ethnic neighborhood in Philadelphia. I got uh, seven brothers and sisters. I'm the, I am the, the fourth out of eight. Um, we had no booze at all my house. Uh, my father did not drink. My mother could not drink, besides being pregnant for almost ten years. <laughs> she was really. My sister's 11 months older than me, and I am 11 months older than my next sister, I guess. <laughs> Irish octuplets. <laughs> Not only was she pregnant for all those years, she also suffered from a history of mental illness and abuse, prescription medication, and my father was smart enough not to have any booze at all in the house. My grandparents lived around the corner from us, and their basement was finished as a bar, and that's where all the family functions were held, the graduations, the christenings, and things like that. And uh, that's where I had my very first drink. I loved my grandparents. My grandparents were immigrants, and uh, so they spoke kind of funny. But... <laughs> But I guess if you come to the neighborhood, uh, you, everyone speaks that way. But, you know, they were great people, and that's where all the family functions were held. And, and my parents come from pretty good-sized families. Uh, my father's one of 11, my mother's one of nine, smaller family. But we had tons of uncles and aunts and cousins, and that's my grandparents' house was always jumping. And that's I loved being there, and I loved the parties that they had there. And like I said, that's where I had my very first drink. I was just a kid. I did not get drunk the first time I drank, but I'll tell you what had happened. I remember what it was, it was Valentine beer, and I remember that because Valentine used to sponsor the Phillies, and I remember going up to Connie Mack Stadium with my father, and they had that old scoreboard in right center field with the three rings, you know, Valentine. And uh, I, get, I forget what their motto is, but they're three rings. I don't know, they're, they're probably not close to four absolutes, but they had the three <laughs> rings up there. And uh, I remember run, I was running around the, uh, the basement bar polishing off the half empties, or the half fulls, I guess it depends on your perception. I was polishing off the half empties, and it was my uncles pointed at me and said, Look at him, look at Bobby. And see, that's why I, I always craved. I never felt a part of. And that's pretty tough to do when you got ten people living in a small three bedroom row home. But I never felt a part of. And that would be true in, into early recovery. You know? My drinking really took off in, in high school. Most of the kids in the neighborhood went to the local diocese in high school. But my parents had sent me to a private Jesuit high school. And right away I felt kind of different because most of the kids who went to the school were from affluent families from the suburbs. Just me and a couple of dirt balls in the neighborhood went there. And right away we had a reputation because we used to walk to the school. And it was in a pretty rough part of the city. And um, so we used to live off that reputation we had. Like, for instance, um, we sold football pools. And if you won, we didn't pay off. And, I mean, what were you going to do? You know, and as these kids were getting dropped off by their parents in their luxury automobiles, me and the guys in the neighborhood were inside robbing their lockers. And I knew that was wrong. I knew that by the values instilled on me by my parents as a kid, by the nuns as a kid. But I did it anyway because the need for me to be accepted by you outweighed anything else. And I had a lot of nicknames, and one of those nicknames was Crazy Coil. And I would do things that I felt uncomfortable doing, I didn't want to do. 
but the need for me to entertain you or to be accepted by you outweighed anything else. Whatever values are, uh, that I had instilled in me as a kid went flying out the window. And I remember my freshman year at the prep. It was football season. It was September. There was an away game. We rented a bus. There was drinking. There was fighting. There was police activity. It was really, I tell you, a lot of fun. <laughs> and I remember our first day back to school. We all had to go see the disciplinarian. And they were all, there was about 10 of us outside his office. And they were all upperclassmen. It was just me and another kid from the neighborhood. We're the only two freshmen there. And he made a beeline. He came right up to us. He says, what's with you guys? You, getting, you guys here like two weeks. You getting this jackpot already? And I just shrugged my shoulders and said, you know, father, just one them things. And what it was, it didn't take me long to size up situations. You know, I didn't play football, so I didn't hang out with those kids. Even though I did somewhat well academically, I didn't hang out with the AP kids. I was there a week and a half. I found out who the nitwits were, and that's who I chose to hang out with. And that would be the story of my life, sizing up, getting in new situations, finding out who the nitwits were, and that's who I want to hang out with. So I remember, it was just nuts. You know, uh, I, I, I didn't make the dean's list. I didn't fail out. I gave the bare minimum effort required to get by, you know, and that would be the story of my life, too, the pattern. Like, mediocrity was my goal, and I was okay with that. I didn't want any attention, good or bad. I gave the bare minimum effort required to get by. I remember in my junior year at the prep, I'm 16. I probably look like I'm 12. I'm dressed like I am now, blazer, slacks, you know. This school was in a pretty rough neighborhood in Philadelphia. It was on the corner of 17th and Girard. Three blocks away is the subway. Well, a lot of these kids from the, uh, the suburbs used to have to take public transportation home. But they were scared to walk the three blocks to the subway. So they would wait for the trolley to come. And they would wait like half hour. And they could be in the, the subway in five minutes if they walked. But they were scared to walk. Well, two blocks away on the corner of 15th and Girard, there was a bar called the Ebony Showcase Lounge. When I was a junior, I was a regular at the Ebony. Now I went there for a couple of different reasons. You know, they had dancers and they had cold beer, but a lot of times me and the guys from the neighborhood would stroll out and draw the avenue to show how tough we were to these kids from the suburbs. And as you can tell by the name of the establishment, that I wasn't from the neighborhood, but they figured if I was crazy enough to walk in to order a beer, they would serve me, you know? And I can now tell you, every time I sat in that bar, I was terrified. But I didn't want anybody else to know, you know, playing the role, you know? And it was just nuts. When it came time to graduate from uh, the prep, I really had no desire to further my education, and that kind of ticked my parents off because uh, they made a great deal of sacrifices. They didn't have much. like a, They were both uh, first generation here, and they knew that education was very important, and they made a great deal of sacrifices to send me and my brothers and sisters to private school. And I knew I couldn't stay home because there'd be hell to catch, and I don't like catching hell. And I really had no any options. Uh, you know, I had no, uh, what, I'm 17, I have no skills, no money, I couldn't get an apartment, couldn't get a job. So the only other thing that I thought left available to me was to enlist in the service, and that's what I did. That really wasn't a bright move back then. The service wasn't popular, uh, but I enlisted anyway. And after my training, I wound up getting sort of sent overseas, and I spent 13 months overseas, and that's when my drinking really took off. I never messed around with other substances. I never even smoked a joint, you know. I had a lot of guys from my neighborhood who had gone over and got whacked on certain things. And I had a fear of other substances. But I had a drinking problem before I went in, and it really kind of took off when I was there. I was there a couple months, and several good friends of mine got killed, and I didn't know how to handle that. Because in my family, we didn't talk about nothing, you know. And, and I think I heard Kate talk about this last night. In my family, and this is not a shot of my folks. I mean, it's just the way it was, uh, you know. Once you moved out of the house, you were no longer privy to the secrets of the family. And if you lived in the house, everything stayed inside you, and everything stayed within the walls. And once you moved out of the house, whether you got married or you went to school, you were no longer privy to the secrets of the family. And that's just the way it was. We didn't talk about nothing. It was all surface stuff, you know. And when my friends got killed, I didn't know how to handle that. But I know the booze numbed the pain, and that's what I did. I drank to numb the pain. And the same thing in the service. I didn't distinguish myself, but I didn't get any jackpots either. I gave the bare minimum effort required to get by. I just did my job and hoped that you didn't even notice me. When my tour was up, I came home. I enrolled in school. I went to St. Joe's, and I uh, wound up taking a couple of civil service exams. And it was the end of the spring semester, and uh, one, of the, one of my friends in the neighborhood had called me up, and he said, Bobby, the Phillies are playing tomorrow. It's one of those businessman specials, you know, like one of those weekday afternoon games. He said, you want to go to the game? I said, sure. Because they weren't going to miss me in the classroom. At that time, I mean, in all four years, I think we didn't have more than 3,000 kids. You know, we had about 20, 25 kids in the class. And I wasn't participating in the classroom, wasn't making the dean's list, but I wasn't failing out either, just skating by, hoping you didn't even notice me. 
And so I said, sure, you know, I'll go to the game. So me and four other guys go to the game the next day. And it's a, like I said, it's the, under, the end of the semester. It's May. It was an unusually warm day. And we're sitting at the top of the stadium. The Phillies had since moved. They're playing at Vet Stadium in South Philadelphia. And I'm drinking that cheap watered-down beer they sell. And the sun's beating down on me, and I'm getting trashed. And I told one of the guys I was with, I said, you know what? I said, I'm going to run down the field and meet one of the players. <laughs> and they said, okay, Bobby. And they kind of shrugged me off because another nickname I had was Bullshit Bob. I said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I did that. I didn't do nothing. I made stories up. That's all I did. I thought it was tough for me to get off the stool. So, but I, I had worked my way down. They used to have an old picnic area there. And I jumped over the fence. I ran out in the field. The San Diego Padres were in town. And Dave Winfield was the right fielder for the Padres. And I ran out in the field and I shook his hand. I said, hi, Dave. How you doing? <laughs> And he looked at me, he said, brother, what are you doing out here? And from behind him, because he's a pretty big dude, behind him I saw the guards come, and I said, Dave, i got to go now. <laughs> so I start running towards the infield. I want to slide into second base. And as I was running towards the infield, there was more guards coming from the third base side. And I knew I couldn't do that, because if I slid into second, I'd get caught. So I start walking uh, towards first base. And I'm as close as the guard, probably as Kay and I are right now. I'm walking like to give myself up. At the last second, I geeked the guy and I ran out in the outfield. <laughs> now, now I'm, running, I'm running around like a screwball. It seems like about 10 minutes, but it's probably like two or three, right? But up on the old school board, they had a right center field. They, they put Mr. Excitement. I mean, I'm running around. I'm jumping, driving. I mean, I just got out of service. I'm in pretty good shape, right? But I'm drunk. I'm out of breath. I'm about to get sick. I got nowhere to go. The fence is 10 feet high. I, I'm stuck. <laughs> So I finally stopped running. And I got these short, young, fat guys chasing me. From the, and, you know, I'm making them. It looks like Keystone Cops. I mean, they, they tripping over each other. So I finally stopped running. I wait in center field for them to grab me. They take me off the field. I got a standing ovation from 37,000 people. <laughs> They taken me up to the bullpen. Tug McGraw was in the bullpen for the Phillies. He gave me the thumbs up. <laughs> now, I knew I was going to get a beating from these guards because I could make them, because I made them look so stupid. They could have beat on me all day long. I don't care. Because you know what? I was going to be a legend in the neighborhood. I would drink for free for the next week off this story. I know. <laughs> Now, see, this would be the type of story that I'd make up, you know, bullshit Bob, right? But I had them four guys from the neighborhood. I knew by the time I got out of jail, they'd be back in the neighborhood talking about me, you know? I just couldn't wait. I actually pictured this as, as I was about to get my beaten. And just then, a Philadelphia police lieutenant showed up. He said, what's the matter with you? He said, are you drunk? Are you high? I said, no, I'm just happy. I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> He said, well, you're going to get your happy ass out of the stadium. <laughs> so not only did he save me from getting a beaten, but he saved me from getting arrested, because that was important. Because a few weeks later, one of them civil service exams kind of panned out. I got hired by the Philadelphia Police Department. <laughs> they was hiring anybody back then. I got hired. There was 8,300 of us. We had a mayor at the time by the name of Frank Rizzo. Frank was a former cop himself. He loved us. We couldn't do no wrong. We were nothing but a gang with badges. I'm not even old enough to drink at this point. The, the drinking age in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania has always been 21. And it's hard to drink in Pennsylvania. Uh, for instance, uh, when I went into service and started going to other states and went like to 7-Eleven to find out you could buy beer and wine in stores like that, man, that really floored me. Because in Pennsylvania, you can't do that. You got to buy beer two ways. You go to the bar and buy a six-pack, or you go to the beer distributor and buy a case. That's it. That's your only options. And to buy liquor, you need to go to the state store. And the state store is closed on Sunday. So I would have to go over Jersey, which I don't mind because the drinking age in Jersey was 18. And where I lived in Philadelphia, I could be over in Jersey quicker than I could be other parts of Philadelphia. You know, I mean, the bars were closed on election day. They get all these blue laws. I mean, it was tough to drink, but <laughs> and not to let that get in the way. But I used to go over Jersey all the time and drink. But once I got on the job, I no longer needed to go to Jersey because, you know, I badged my way in wherever I want to go. I spent the first 10 years of my uh, career in North Philadelphia where I would see the ravages of alcoholism and drug addiction day in, day out, you know, and uh, the handwriting was on the wall. I need to back up for a moment. That story I talk about running on the baseball field, I tell that story for a couple of different reasons. One, it's the only funny story I got. <laughs> I wasn't a funny guy. I wasn't an athlete. I wasn't a lover. I was none of that stuff. I was a lying, thieving, stinking, falling down, violent, drunk. And if I hung around you, you had something I wanted. I used and abused everybody I came in contact with. I was a creep. Secondly, I was a, it's a true story. I got them four guys from the neighborhood that could back me up. <laughs> but, but thirdly, and more importantly, I was a blackout drinker. 
I was a blackout drinker from my very first start. I remember in high school, the first time I drank, I blacked out, you know. And that would be the story. I remember coming on the corner the next day, you know, we hung on the corner, and guys would tell me stories of behavior that I exhibited the night before. And later that night, I would be retelling those stories like I remembered them. And I was a blackout drinker from the very first start, so that was just wild. It was funny. I never knew what blackouts were. I remember when I was in the VA hospital, the doctor asked me, he said, do you ever have any blackouts? I said, no. I must have answered too quickly for him because he said, do you know what they were? I said, no. Once he described them, <laughs> once he described them to me, I said, all the time. I thought that's how you could call it a good load. I mean, if you, had a bl- that, if you didn't catch a blackout, if you didn't remember, you didn't catch a, your load wasn't good enough. That was just nuts. <laughs> so I'm working up in North Philly, and the handwriting's on the wall. I'm at a family function one time, and my uncle, he was a boss on the job, and I, he pulled me off to the side. He said, Bobby, I'm hearing stories about you. You're going to get yourself in the jackpot. You better take it easy. In one ear and out the other. I was at work one day, and my immediate supervisor pulled me off to the side. He said, you know what, kid? You're smart. You're going to go places. That booze is going to mess you up. In one ear and out the other. Several years later, on two separate occasions, I ran into my uncle and that supervisor in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I realized that at that point that they were trying to 12-step me, especially my uncle Jimmy, you know. I, you know, you figured he's sober, he's the black sheep of the family. But I remember talking to him when I finally met him in the meeting. I said, you know, how come he didn't tell me? You know, he gave me one of them old-timer smiles. He said, Bobby, you just weren't ready yet. Which just goes to show you that all the drinking and all the nonsense that went, went with it were necessary for me to hit my bottom. I knew about Alcoholics Anonymous. I made my first meeting in 1979. I don't tell people I went out because I really never came in, but I'll tell you what happened. I showed up at work one day, and uh, one of my uh, guys I worked with was really out of his mind drunk. And on our, on our job, we had a council unit, an EAP unit, and within that EAP unit, they had regular AA meetings. And they had this little setup in this little house that sat in a park. And I showed up at work one day, and the supervisor said, take this guy up to the unit. He's going to be detailed there for the day. I said, okay. So I come driving down this uh, this little driveway, and then this little house is sat in the middle of the park. And this guy sitting on the porch, a guy is Eddie, Eddie M. And Eddie had worked downstairs in the building that I worked at. He was the turnkey. And he was always a crusty guy. And I pulled up, and I said, oh. So I pulled up and said, Eddie, I'm dropping this guy off. He's detailed here for the day. I'll be back at 4 o'clock to pick him up. He looked me dead in the eye. He said, kid, do you want to come in? I said, no, I don't. I was insulted that he even asked me. Because I knew what alcoholics were. Alcoholics were you older guys, you married guys, you guys with the three heads. I mean, <laughs> these, these poor people I was dealing with day in, day out, they were alcoholic. There's no way I could be an alcoholic because I was pretty successful and I was a beer drinker. And there's no way that you could be an alcoholic drinking beer. I mean, the only time I drank hard liquor was like on St. Patty's Day or New Year's Day or payday. But I was a beer drinker. <laughs> And I remember when I got sober, one of the first guys I saw, Eddie was there, and he just smiled. He said, so, kid, you finally came around. Again, just to show you that all the drinking, all the nonsense that went with it were necessary for me to hit my bottom. I was 24 years old. I shot and killed a 15-year-old kid in line of work in a terrible situation that couldn't be avoided. You know, the psychologists now have a term, uh, suicide by, by, by police, but 20-some years ago that wasn't around. And I used it as an excuse to crawl in a bottle, and that's what I did for my next three years. I wound up getting sober when I was 27. Drinking took me to a lot of my nevers, and one of those nevers was the use of a lot of substances. I wound up getting promoted and transferred on my job, and I was put in this position where I thought I needed to get, engage in other substances. I was drinking, I was drunk, my judgment was impaired, and I got involved in other substances. My drug history is very short. It lasted 17 months, and it caused me and a lot of other people a lot of problems. And out of respect of the fifth tradition, that's why I need to talk about that stuff. That's where I went, okay? So uh, my life was falling apart, you know. I was uh, I was sitting home from work one day, and I'm reading the Daily News, and they had an article, and at the end of the article, they had a little box. It had a phone number and had some questions. It said alcohol problems, drug problems, depression, marital problems, thoughts of suicide, and had a phone number. I was four out of five because I was single, and I'm sure if I was married, <laughs> I'm sure if I was married, I'd been batting a thousand, you know. And they talk about the moment of clarity, but I stuck that, I cut that wild out, uh, cut the ad out, stuck it in my wild, and continued on drinking. It was Memorial Day weekend, 1988, and I'm sitting in a bar, guys from my squad, we were in trouble, so we went to get our story straight, and it just turned out to be another drinking fiasco. One of the guys I was with decided that he needed to go home for some reason. I decided I would give him a ride home, because I did not think that I was as drunk as he was, and he thought that was a good idea. I'm a show-off, I always was an arrogant guy, and uh, so I was going to show off my driving skills, because I thought I was the best at everything, you know, just, just pure arrogance.
And I was going to show off my driving skills, which I didn't mind since it wasn't my car, you know. <laughs> you know, and uh, I would see these things on TV or in the movies, and I thought I would duplicate them. And I now know that everything's set up in advance, and you can't do those things. But uh, I always try to do them anyway, you know. And it, it was a city car. It wasn't mine, so I didn't care. So I was driving up the street. I had this guy and uh, with me. And about a few blocks away, I saw a kid riding towards me on a bicycle. And I was going to play chicken with this kid. I thought it would be funny because on the left hand, on my left-hand side, on the driver's side, was a large stone wall. And I thought that he would jump the curb and grab the wall and get a couple of laughs. So as I get closer to this kid, unfortunately, at the last second, we turned in the same direction. I ran this kid over. As he lie bleeding on the hood of my car, I got out of my car. My knife stick was going to beat this kid because I thought he was milking me in the city for an insurance claim. The guy that I was with prevented me from doing that. I took this kid off the hood of my car, threw him, on my, threw him off the side of the street like a piece of trash. I pulled this crumpled bicycle from my, my car, threw that off the side of the street like a piece of trash. I drove back to the bar, made some sort, sort of a smart out remark, and I continued on drinking. When I came to it the next day, I realized I was in serious, serious trouble, but I didn't think anybody helped me because I was such a creep. Then I didn't know what to do. So what I did do, I got a case of beer, a bottle of liquor, and some other substances, and I checked into a hotel to, to, with the intent to consume all this stuff to build up the courage of my life. And three days later, they're knocking on the hotel door to kick me out. I couldn't shoot myself at this point. I was suspended from my job. I no longer, I got, I no longer had access to my weapon. So I went over to the window, and I opened up the window, and I was going to jump out the window. And when I opened up the window, I was on the fifth floor, and I remembered I was afraid of heights. <laughs> 23 jumps, I never overcame my fear of heights. So then I went in the bathroom, and I built the bathtub of water, and I had a blow dryer. I was going to pull the blow dryer in the tub to make it appear an accidental electrocution. And every time I pulled the blow dryer into the tub, it would come unplugged. I was about a foot and a half short on cord, and I got one foot in the tub, and I'm laying and trying to plug it in. And it's like that scene out of that Woody Allen movie where he couldn't even kill himself. And it's okay to laugh, but I never, I don't want to forget the pain I was in that day. And the only other tool that I had left was my car. So I took one last spin to the neighborhood. I started up at the Falls Bridge, and I come down the East River Drive, which is a very winding road along the Skoka River. And my intent was to go into oncoming traffic to end my life. And I handled, job, I handled jobs like that. I knew that would definitely do the trick. It was like a Wednesday or Thursday, 10, 10.30 in the morning, and that would be important because if it was any other time, I would have probably succeeded in what I intended to do. And as I was coming down the drive, you know, I'm hungover, I'm cooped, I'm out of my mind, you know, and, and, uh, and as, I, as I was about to go on oncoming traffic, I had remembered something. I was always haunted by something. I saw a lot of things on the job that bothered me, but this one particular thing was far from the worst, but... I remember I had to do a notification before. I had to knock on someone's door, and uh, I was young. I was in my 20s, and this guy, he was definitely older. had to be in his 40s, early 40s. And I knocked on his door, and I had to tell him that his son was killed in an automobile accident. This kid was just a teenager. This guy's, I had literally, this guy's life left. I mean, he, it, it, life just left this guy. I saw this happen. It's just hard to describe. But uh, I would see him a few weeks later in court, and he, he looked like an old man. You know, he was never the same. His family never recovered. I tried to stay in contact with him. And I was always haunted by that. And it was by far, it wasn't the worst. I mean, I had I, much more uh, other instances on the job, but I was always haunted by that. As, as out of my mind as I was that day, that's the only reason I did not go on the oncoming traffic, because as much pain that I was in and I needed to end my pain, I could not see myself inflicting that type of damage on another family, an innocent family at that. But I knew I needed to end my pain, so I decided to wrap myself around a tree, and we got these big old oak trees along the drive, and I knew I handled jobs like that. You hit these trees, trees don't tend to move, and that would definitely do the trick too. And then I just lost it. You know, I'm crying, and I finally pulled over at the end of East River Drive, which is Boathouse Row, and I sat behind the wheel of my car, and I cried like a baby for about 10 minutes. And I reached into my glove box where I always carried an extra gun, and it wasn't there. But my wallet was there, and inside that wallet was that article that I clipped out that I knew was about six weeks before. And it's no longer there, but outside the last boathouse one, was one of those old glass of clothes phone booths. And I went over to the phone booth, and I dialed the phone number up. And the woman who answered the phone, I uh, spoke to this woman like I spoke to no one in my life before. I told her the truth. Everything that was going on in my life, and once I started, I couldn't stop. It just, it just everything was pouring out. And God bless her, she listened patiently. And when I got done, she said, listen, why don't you drive over to Hahnemann Hospital? Someone will be waiting to talk to you. I said, okay. So I got in my car. It's like about a five-minute drive. I drove over to the hospital. They were waiting for me. They admitted me to their 10th floor, their psychiatric unit. And they kept me there for about three or four days. got me kind of stabilized. And from there, I got transferred to the VA hospital out in West Philadelphia. And I spent about six weeks in their flight deck. And then I got transferred to the VA hospital out in Coatesville, where I spent a few more weeks in their flight deck before they put me in an alcohol and drug ward. When I pulled over that day and made that phone call, Alcoholics Anonymous was the furthest thing from my mind. 
I didn't think I was an alcoholic. I mean, I, I was a beer drinker. There's no way they could be an alcoholic drinking beer. I thought my main problem was these other substances. If I left that crap alone, I'd be okay. Maybe I got this mental illness. I heard this from my mother. Maybe I got this stress stuff they're now talking about. I got this experience on the job. I got this in the service. Maybe it's the neighborhood I live in. Maybe it's the fact that I'm a mummer. But it can't be alcohol because I'm a beer drinker, and there's no way you could be an alcoholic drinking beer. I get into the VA hospital in Coatesville after I get off the flight deck, and at this point, I'm probably about eight, eight, ten weeks under my belt. I wander into the day room. I'm in the alcohol and drug ward about a half hour. The arrogance creeps back in. I got to get scammed to lay the land, you know, see what's going on. I wander into the day room, and in the day room, up on the wall, they had the large window shades of the 12 steps and the 12 traditions. I zip through the steps. I have about six of them done. I see the immense parts that they're screwed. That doesn't apply to me. But it just shows you how warped I was. But later that night, two men came up, and they, I would later find out that they were part of the treatment facility committee. Did not know that then. They came up to carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. The moment that the speaker said something about his background that I did not like, did not identify with, or couldn't relate to, I would immediately tune him out. I was too busy listening to the messenger and not the message. Now I'm looking around my peers, and you know what? I'm really not that bad. A lot of these guys got long drug histories. That's not my deal. These guys, multiple treatment experiences, not my experience. These guys had wives who hated them, kids they couldn't see, not my experience. Probably due to the fact that I'd never been married and didn't have any kids. May had something to do with that. <laughs> they all had legal problems. I didn't have any legal problems. Probably due to the fact that I had a gold shield in my back pocket. I was looking for the differences and not the similarities. But what bothered me the most, without any question, was at the end of the meeting, everyone got in a group, got in a circle, and said the Lord's Prayer. If this is what your people are about, that I want nothing to do with you, because I hated God. And I know they're strong words, but you know what? It doesn't even begin to sum up the feeling I had. And there were a lot of reasons I hated God, and they were all legitimate. But no more so than that. Uh, I talk about my mom's mental illness. My mom was a fundamentalist in the church, you know, and she was in a charismatic movement. She thought she could speak in tongues. And, the, you know, radio programs and icons throughout the house and all types of things. I was 15 years old. I came home from school one day. I'm in the house about 10, 15 minutes, and I came across my mother, and my mother had slit her wrist. And I remember she looked up at me. She said, Bobby, help me. And I looked down at her and said, good for you. And I walked out of the house. And I got an older guy to go to the state store and got a bottle of wine, and I drank the wine, and I came home later that night, and my father told me what happened. I said, oh, yeah, how about that? That happened when I was 15. I got sober when I was 27. That's 12 years of hating God. And it would be a few more years before I would even address this. So I didn't hold hands, and I didn't say the prayer. When I got out of the VA hospital, right before I got out, I was getting the discharge. A nurse came up to me, and, I, and please, I'm saying this, and it's not to get a laugh. She had to be a member of Al-Anon. She was just a beautiful lady, and she saw all through my stuff. Well, that's all it was. It was the facade. And she came up to me. She said, you know what? The only way you're going to make it, you're going to need to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I need to tell you that's the best piece of advice I got. And that's where I would get my recovery. I would get in Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't get it at the VA hospital. The VA hospital helped me with a lot of things. They, they were a tremendous help. But I would get my recovery in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I went to AA every single day, sometimes two or three times a day, depending when I was working. I don't drink coffee, so I don't make it. I don't smoke cigarettes, so I don't empty any ashtrays. I don't take your phone numbers because most of you are screwballs anyway. <laughs> I go to a big book meeting or step meeting that was strictly by accident. I would leave it to break out something more important to do. Tradition meetings, rules. My line of work, we love to enforce them. We don't like to follow them. They're for other people. <laughs> but I made meetings every single day, and I was crazy as a bed bug. I was sitting in this bar because they sold real good roast beef, right? And I'm sober, uh, probably about 10, 11 months, and a couple guys from the neighborhood walk in, and they just start just breaking my, you know, they start giving me a hard way to go. You know, you know, and it was necessary for me, because I was a very arrogant guy, you know, and, uh, you know, I got a lot of publicity, uh, and, uh, you know, just in case you men missed it, I would have an extra three or four articles in the car that you could read and take home if you want. So, but towards the end of my drinking, because of my behavior, there was a lot of negative publicity. And that was the real reason I was in the bar that day. I was, just, I was showing off still. Don't believe the hype. I don't know who that guy was. I'm back. It's, things are cool. And these guys came in, and I knew these guys well, and they, just start, you know, they felt it necessary to knock me down a notch, and I don't blame them. And, but the one kid, unfortunately, got a little too close to me. And I stood up, and, and I was drinking seltzer out of a rock glass. And I stood up, and I punched him right in the face, and I cut him open. He cut him open bad. He bled like a pig. And the uniform guy came in who handled it. Two of them guys came in. I knew one of the guys who handled the job. And he came up to me and said, what the hell are you doing here? You know, and I told him what happened. He said, get out of here. You're nuts. 
And it's a good thing he did that because if I got pinched, I mean, that could have been a serious jackpot. But he let me go, and uh, that's where I learned my lessons about people, places, and things. And I have since found a real good place with sells roast beef with, without being in that type of environment. And if you're ever in a neighborhood, we go out and get one. I promise not to hit anybody. You know, it's just not. But that's how nuts I was. I, my one-year anniversary, I, my home group at that, that time, you told your story. And I tell you, it was, man, I got done speaking. It was amazing. Thunderous applause, the blind could see, the lame walked. It was a really incredible experience. <laughs> and people came up and they patted him in the back and said, Bobby, you're doing so good. I lied during my entire story. The fact that I identified myself as an alcoholic because of my group, you couldn't talk about that other stuff. I didn't think I was an alcoholic. I thought my short, my, I still thought my problems with the other substances. I thought I had this stress stuff. I had this mental illness. I'm a mummer. It's a neighborhood I live in. But I'm a beer drinker. In fact, during the course of my story, a bottle of beer appeared in my head. But you guys didn't want to hear that. You want to hear all the quotes. And, and that's what I gave you. I was a pretty sharp guy. I knew how to hold on to uh, information. And that's what I gave you. And they patted me in the back and said, Bobby, you're doing so good. And I was dying inside. I was sober 23 months. I beat another man with a baseball bat. Forget what step I was working that day. <laughs> I was nuts. I swear to God. I did everything wrong you could do in Alcoholics Anonymous. The only thing I didn't do, I didn't pick up a drink. And people came up and they patted me in the back and said, that's okay, Bobby, just don't drink. And I took that as, oh, I can do whatever the hell I want to do and just not drink. I swear to God, I'm not proud of this. My first couple of years, right, I used to go to a lot of gentlemen's clubs, but I drank soda. I drank soda. I would get my picture taken with the entertainer. Then I would come to the meetings and pitch the picture around because I figured the old timer would like that. <laughs> they, they would look at the picture and they would look at me and they would shake their head and say, please, kid, please keep coming back. And I thought they were being facetious. So I said, all right, I'll keep coming back. I mean, I was a liar, thief, and a cheat. I did everything wrong. In alcohol. I was a creep with the new women. I did everything wrong. And the only thing I didn't do, I didn't pick up a drink. But I was nuts. My home group, we had a court board, anniversaries for the month, you know, first name, last initial, day of the month you're celebrating, how many years. If Joey A had three years and Bobby C got two years and Joey A went out, I said, good for him, he's out. This is about time, isn't it? I mean, that's what I thought. I mean, I didn't care. He's out, I'm in. I didn't care. My very first meeting, my very first outside meeting, there was a man and woman celebrating 10 years of sobriety. The woman had one more day than her husband. And she constantly reminded them of that throughout her story, how she had one more day. But it was just nuts, and I couldn't believe it. I said, 10 years, get out of here. You know, I thought maybe you'd go over in Jersey and drink and keep your Pennsylvania time. But I, I had no idea. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't believe these people at the time. But there was a guy from my neighborhood, Troubles. He was sober 18 months, and that was a hard-earned nickname. He was the only reason I came back to my second Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. I actually thought he was dead or in jail, because he was always in jail. And here he was. He was sober and alcohol. I said, Christ, Troubles get sober, and he, I might as well come. I mean, my motive was not pure, you know. Uh, it was nuts. Uh, I had no idea who John Barleycorn was. I was wondering, why. first of all, why is, why is everybody blowing this guy's anonymity? You know, I said, he's a real tough SOB. I wouldn't want to tangle with him. When I found out who John Barleycorn was, I felt so stupid. But here I was, I was so damn bright, it damn near killed me, you know. I made a lot of meetings. But, you know, the worst meeting was on Sunday night after retreat. I would go to meetings like on Friday and Saturday. So where the hell's there? Where's everybody at? And then Sunday night, they'd all show up, floating into the meeting with this glow around. Oh, Christ, they were out of retreat this weekend. <laughs> and they would call in, and they would share their serenity. And I tell you, it's very rare that I got my hand up. The only time I got my hand uh, Serene people scared the hell out of me. And I, I loved crazy meetings. And if the meeting wasn't crazy, that's the only time I got my hand up to share my insanity. And I would sit back and watch this show. I loved craziness. And these guys were serene. I said, oh, man. And you know what? The one thing for, I never left meetings. I tell people I've never been to a bad meeting. I've been to some meetings I've never been back to, but I've never been to a bad meeting. And, I, and I, that was always a good habit. I, I've always stayed for the duration, even these serene meetings. And I said, oh, Christ. One day they came up to me, and the way you trick a new, uh, a new guy is you don't give him a chance to formulate the lie. They come up to me, they said, Bobby, are you working this weekend? And before I know it, I said, no, it was too late. I wish I could have pulled that word back, it was too late. They said, we're going on a retreat this weekend, we're going to take it with us. Now, I couldn't go with you. You know, I, I tell you, these guys, I would wait, like after the meeting, like they'd all be sitting in their circle, and I'd be coming up next to them, and then they would invite me out and say, Bobby, we're going to the diner after, would you want to come with us? I would say, no. But if they didn't invite me, I got mad. And I, and I, I stood there and waited until I got the invitation. As soon as they said, they said, you want to come? I said, nope. I never, I mean, they, they were nuts. I was nuts. They were all right. I was just nuts. So they said, we're going to go on a retreat this weekend. I said, all right. 
And it was a Friday afternoon, I clear as a bell, and, and I'm in the back seat with a big guy on each side of me. That's like role reversal, because at work, I drive, you're in the back. But here I am, I'm in the back seat with a big guy on each side of me, and we're driving up to the retreat house, and the closer we get to the retreat house, the bigger the knot gets in my stomach. Because they knew I had a problem with God, because I wasn't saying the prayer, I wasn't holding the hands, I just refused to do that. Now, I was sober long enough in Alcoholics Anonymous that, and that I knew that you could not get kicked out of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> But unfortunately, I was sober long enough to also realize that not everyone is as greeted as warmly as the next person for one reason or the other. I couldn't tell these guys about my mom. Like, what would they think of me then, you know? But the need for me to be accepted by these guys outweighed anything else. So I'm willing to do this. And the knock gets bigger. I get to the retreat house. It's a Friday afternoon. It's like 4.30, 5 o'clock. They said, Bobby, we want to introduce you to the retreat master. I said, oh, Christ, all right, come on, let's get this over with. And they walk me down this old, long hallway. They knock on this panel door. The door opens. I walk in. The guy sitting in the chair gives me a big old smile. He comes up and he hugs me. He's my disciplinarian from high school. <laughs> but not only that, but he find out also he's a longtime member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he just smiles and he has the twinkle in his eye. And I really never liked this guy. But you know what? He just had this goodness about him that I could feel, you know. And uh, it was an incredible experience. So he says, how you doing? I said, I'm doing good, Father. How you doing? And he wants to know how long I'm sober. I'm telling him what the deal is, how long I'm sober. He wants to know where I'm going to meetings. I'm giving him the 411, you know. He says, who's your sponsor? I says, I don't have one. He said, I'm a pretty bright guy. He knew that. He knew I was a bright guy. Because every time I was in discipline, he'd always say, Bobby, you're a pretty bright guy. But I would always be in discipline. Actually, it was called Jug. We called it Jug, which stood for judgment under God. But that was, that's a whole different story. <laughs> you used to have to go into church and train like the Latin. It was, that was our punishment. But uh, uh, it was just nuts. So he said, uh, so I told him, I said, I didn't have a sponsor. He said, I strongly suggest you get a sponsor. So I asked my roommate to be my sponsor. God forbid, should I ever be questioned again, who's your sponsor? There he goes right there. That's my sponsor. And the only time I talked to this guy is when I accidentally bumped to him in the meetings. I would see him in meetings. He would wave at me and say, Bobby, I still get the same phone number. I said, yeah, yeah, I'll give you a call. Know what I used to do? I never called him. I used to tell other people, you won't believe this guy. He wants me to do this. He wants me to do that. He didn't do nothing. I made it up. <laughs> Not only did he put the hand of AA out there, I slapped it away. Then I character assassinated the guy the boat. I mean, that's just how nuts I was. I swear to God, I, I was, man... I took a commitment to set chairs up for a beginner's meeting, and the, the room was set up like this, obviously not that many. And the table was here, and all the chairs set. So me and my other good friend in my neighborhood, Wacky Jackie, <laughs> appropriately named, we come in on a Tuesday night, we set all the chairs, we go that way. And they all came in, and I, and I was one of the reaction. And people came in, and I could tell they were disturbed, but nobody said anything. So I said, all right. So next week they came in, and the entrance was in the back of the room, so I set all the chairs that way. <laughs> Still, they was looking around. They was upset, but still, no one. And you know, you got to get that reaction. Next week, we got it. We set all the chairs up facing that way. As soon as they came in the chair, that was it. At the break, they got a couple older guys, along with some of the larger men in the group, and they came up to me and Jackie and said, knock it off. You want to sit these chairs up next week, they go that way and knock that shit off. And, but that's the type of the guy I was. I mean, I was, just, I was just nuts, you know? But you know what? I make fun of these guys, but you know what? They were good men. They really were. They tolerated my nonsense. They did everything. They embraced me. And I guess they knew that I was just, uh, I was just a scared little kid at heart because that's all it was. Again, it was all facade. And they saw right through it, you know? I was sober. My second anniversary, I did not celebrate it. Two years sober. One month after my second anniversary, I went to eat my gun. The same pathetic feeling I had 25 months before, but 25 months before I'm loaded with drugs and alcohol. Here I am, stone cold sober in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I want to eat my gun. Safe to assume my life was unmanageable. I hated everybody, but you know what I hated the most? I hated the new people. Because when I first came in, I didn't believe you people with time, but at this point I got two years, and if you told me you had eight, I said, okay, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. You know, I know you had six, six and two is eight, you got eight now, okay. <laughs> But you know what I hated the most? I hated the new guys because these guys I actually saw come in. Because when I came in, I didn't see you. I always knew you as sober. I saw these new guys come in, rambling idiots, nuts, and they got better in front of my eyes. As much as I hated God, and I still hated God, I knew that there was something at work here. 
I mean, I see these guys. Six months later, they're speaking in complete sentences. <laughs> a year later, they got their teeth fixed. 18 months, they got a driver's license. They finished their probation. They're dating people. I mean, you know, they're getting jobs. I mean, I saw these guys get better before my eyes, and I hated them the most because they had a glow about them. And I'm about time, and how dare they get it before me. But the reason they got it before me, they were willing to do some work that I was not willing to do. So I said a month after my second anniversary, I went to eat my gun. The following Friday night, I was at the Wissanoma uh, meeting on a Friday night, and my friend Troubles was there. And I went up to him afterwards after the meetings, and I said, Bobby, because he didn't like to be called Troubles, and he was big enough he, he, to be called whatever he wanted. <laughs> I, went up to, I said, Bobby, I said, I need some help. I said, would you help me? He said, Bobby, I've been watching you these past couple years, and I'm sticking my chest out. He said, yeah, he kind of likes me. He says, I need to tell you. He said, you're full of shit. That's not the response I'm looking for. <laughs> he said, I'm going to be your sponsor under certain conditions. A, you're going to call me every single day. You're going to go to a big book meeting, or you're going to go to a men's meeting, you're going to go to a step meeting. You're going to get yourself a coffee commitment, and you're going to, and you're going to leave them damn women alone. And I'm saying to myself, who's he talking to? I'm sober 25 months. I'm selling the grapevines. I got it going on here. But what I did do, I looked them dead in the eye. I said, okay, that's what I'm going to do. And that's the night that I took the first three steps in Alcoholics Anonymous. We went back to his house afterwards. We sat down, and he opened up the book, and he said, listen, I'm just going to talk. You're going to listen because you don't know nothing. I said, okay. <laughs> and here I am. You know, I'm a you know, college graduate, and I, he probably has a GED, and I'm probably being generous with that. But I sat there. But you know what? He had this glow about him because it just wasn't in the rooms of alcohol, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. I actually saw him in the neighborhood where he was walking the walk. I knew that he was the real deal. So we sat down, and we went over the first few chapters, and then we got to... Uh, the third step prayer. We got on our knees together and we did the third step prayer. And when we got done, he said, Bobby, the way we do a third step, we pick paper and pen up and do a fourth step. And I said, whoa, easy does it. <laughs> Don't want to get well too soon. <laughs> Let's just keep it simple. You know, I mean, I was nuts. I didn't want to do one of these inventories. I'm going to meetings and people say, oh, I'm doing my inventory, stirring some stuff up. I feel like going out. I mean... I want to eat my gun. You can't get no further out than that, you know? So I did the inventory. And you know what? It wasn't a great big deal. Everything I wrote down, I did. It wasn't a big deal at all, you know? That next step, that would be the big deal, the fifth step. But I'm a smart guy. I got this angle figured out. So I called Bobby up. I said, Bobby, I'm going to go to retreat this week, and I'm going to do this fifth step with a priest. He said, Bobby, that's great. When you get done with me, but when you get done there, stop over so you can do it with me. <laughs> and I'm looking. I'm like, you know, on through the phone, like, like, what are you, deaf? Do you hear what I said? But what he did, before I could say something, flip. He said, Bobby, he says, I'm your sponsor. He says, I'm supposed to walk you through this. This is a journey. I'm supposed to help you with your character defects. I think I should need to know what they are even though I have a good idea, and he hung up on me. <laughs> now, I need to tell you, the reason I want to do that fifth step was not through any, no spiritual enlightenment. I got the, on the resentment list. I got the church. I hate God. You know, I got all that stuff down. I still hate God. I mean, I, it wasn't to be spiritually enlightened. It was just my experience as a, as a kid, the way I grew up. I knew if I spoke to the priest, it would re, be, remain between me, him, and the lamppost. Nobody else would know. See, I was afraid to step to my stump answer because I thought he would ridicule me. I thought he would pass judgment. Or even worse, I thought that he would break the confidence. Which goes to show you my fearless wasn't quite done yet. I did that fist step with my sponsor. I never did it with a priest. And those, they turned out to be unfounded fears. He did none of those things. He did, did not pass judgment on me. He did not ridicule me. And to the best of my knowledge, he never broke the confidence. In fact, what he did, he shared some of his experience with me, which took away the terminal uniqueness in which I thought that I had. And I'll be forever grateful for him doing that. See, he had actually taken someone's life and went to prison and paid that price. And But that's not why I asked him to be my sponsor. There were other reasons, too. But he was just an incredibly good man. And he wasn't proud of his past, and uh, he wasn't ashamed of the latter, but he didn't wear it on his sleeve. It was what it was. It was his experience, you know. And, but he carried himself as a gentleman, and uh, he helped me tremendously. You know, and as I got done my inventory, as, uh, when we got done the fifth step, I'm about to leave. So, whoa, whoa. You gotta, sit, you gotta sit here quietly for the hour. He lived by himself. He had a small house. He had one of his rooms set up as a quiet room. And I sat quietly for that one hour. And I didn't nod off. 
And it was the first time in my life I ever sat quietly more than 10 minutes. Because remember what I used to, what I said when I went to meetings, when meetings were serene and, you know, calm, I would have to get my hand up because I was uncomfortable with that. You know, you know, you know, the old saying, you, uh, you can't miss what you never had. Well, I never had a peace of mind, so I never missed a damn thing. I love things crazy. So I sat there quietly for one hour and it's probably a little bit longer because he knocked on the door and I know in my heart that I didn't drift off. I didn't nod off. I just sat there quietly. And I could only share my experience. When I got done, the screaming inside stopped. Now, that may not sound like a lot for me, but you know what? That was a hell of an experience. At this point, I'm probably sober about 32, 33 months because I didn't do that inventory as quickly as I should have. You know, there were a lot of times I tried to stay sober on yesterday's sobriety. I told people I didn't get involved in the steps through any volition of my own. I didn't wake up one day and decide I wanted to be a decent human being. Pain and desperation is what chased me. And when things were going well, I was kicked back. And when my back was against the wall, when I was in serious turmoil, emotional turmoil, that's when I would write more. So at this point, I'm sober 32, 33 months. We didn't burn my fourth step when we did the fifth step because I, he told me that I would need this for the next few steps. Character defects. I didn't know what these were. I knew when I drank, I was certainly a character. <laughs> I found out when I did my inventory that I had no character whatsoever. I thought I was the best cop in the city. It's, uh, the fact was that I wasn't. I engaged in behaviors that were uh, that I knew were wrong. Uh, you know, I put other people at risk. I uh, you know, I compromised the integrity that was entrusted to me. I did a lot of things I wasn't proud of. I thought I was the best uncle in the world. The truth was, I was rotten. I missed key family functions just because I thought I was generous with some gifts. That's what made me a good uncle. I was a rotten brother. I remember I went to one of my sister's weddings. Dating a punk rocker at the time. She showed up. She was wearing a leopard skin mini skirt for a wedding. I show up. We're half in the three sheets of the wind when we show up. We got there late. The service is already going on. So instead of closing a scene, we just slid into the last pew. And when the service was over, you know, my sister's walking down the aisle. She looked at me. I can tell she was disappointed. My father was behind her. He, he wasn't disappointed. He was angry. Yeah, I could see the in his eyes. He was very angry. And uh, so afterwards, I said, oh, they're upset. I said, they're going to take pictures. That's probably going to take a while. We're probably going to get a few more drinks. We could show up. We'll make the reception in time. She said, okay. We come into the reception or halfway through dinner. I don't know who tripped over a chair, either her or I, but it was just, we just caused a scene. And see, there were the types of things I did, you know? I wasn't a good brother or the nephew or the, uh, the uncle or whatever role I thought I had. Drinking was more important than anything else. And whatever else got in the way, shame on you, you know? So um, character defects, I knew what they were. In the sixth step, I became willing to have them removed. And the seventh step was a prayer. And my sponsor told me, you got to put legs in those prayers. I could pray all day long. I got, I got a laundry list of character defects. Not that I need to share them all with you, but let's say one of them is that sometimes I may not be the most patient guy. You know, I could pray all day long. God, help me be patient. Help me be patient. But during the course of my day, should you cross my path and you kind of push my buttons and I lash out in sarcasm, and sarcasm is nothing but anger, also referred to as language of the Irish. But if I lash out in sarcasm, that prayer for patience goes right out the window, you know. And so that's what I need to do. Because I didn't burn my fourth step when I did my fifth step, my eighth step was halfway done. And I had to throw more names. And I was one of these guys, you catch me at an eighth or ninth step meeting, I said, I never harmed anybody but myself. Right there should have been a tip off. I never did my inventory because when I got done my inventory, I found out that I harmed everybody I came in contact with. And unfortunately, those closest to me the most were harmed the most. And I had to throw more names down there. And the ninth step, I, you know, and I became willing. And if I didn't have a willingness, I can pray. And then ninth step direct amends. No phone calls, no letters for me. You know why? Because I didn't beat you with the bat over the mail or through the phone. You know, <laughs> I, I, I just didn't do that. And I'd like to share two experiences on the ninth step. I'm at this meeting uh, one night. It's about 16 years ago. And I got asked to, to speak. And I saw this guy walk down the steps. I'm sitting at the table. The meeting's about to start. I have not seen this guy since 1977. He is not on my A step list, not for any fear, just plain forgot. You know, they say more will be revealed. Well, as soon as he came down the steps, it was revealed. I remember what him clearly. He did not recognize me. You know, we sober up, we clean up. Tell you what I used to do. I used to, uh, he was a big guy. I used to like fighting big guys. And I could, I, you know, what Dennis said a couple nights ago. I always fought big guys. I don't know why. I wasn't good at it. 
get it, but that's just what we did, you know. <laughs> so uh, I, I recognized this guy, and one day, what I, I tell you, we went to a bar one time, and we had an exchange, and he kind of backed down. So from that point on, whenever I, want, uh, whenever I want to impress anybody how tough or nuts I was, I would pick on this guy. I'm not a tough guy. I never was. And like one day, I, I slapped him. He didn't do nothing. And then one day, I spat upon him. I mean, what worse the utter degradation of spitting on another human being? You know, he came down the steps, he sat in the chair. I can still picture this clear as a bell. He sat in the third row and he was at the end of the row. And when I got introduced, I looked him dead in the eyes. And my name is Bobby Coyle. I'm an alcoholic. Now I need to take a moment here and tell you why I use my full name. I know these traditions are top secret and we're not even going to go anywhere near the concepts. But these traditions are top secret and no more so than this 11th tradition that people get confused about. All of a sudden, we get sober, right? It's like we join the mafia. We get nicknames. <laughs> you know, there's Frank the Fox, Jimmy the Coat, Bucktooth Mary, Red Sweater Jerry, Pepsi George, John the Brick. You know, the list goes on. <laughs> I don't want nobody in my neighborhood. God forbid my reputation should be tarnished by knowing by them knowing I go to Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> Everybody in my neighborhood knows I'm a stark, raven, lunatic drunk. There's those little telltale signs. They come outside, they catch me, I'd be urinating on their car. <laughs> my girlfriend tore the clothes out the window. I'm slumped behind the wheel of the car. I'm a drunk. I'm, a, uh, I'm getting in trouble in the job. I'm getting bad press. But God forbid my reputation should be tarnished going to AA. <laughs> you know, the 11 tradition is real clear. Personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. That means you will never see my face clearly identified. I love them pictures with the Long Ranger mask back in the day. That's pretty cool. <laughs> but that's fist step stuff. But, you know, I, I, you know, you'll never see my full face clearly identified, followed by my name, which is Robert Ignatius Benedict Coyle III, <laughs> followed by the statement, is a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. That would be a violation of the 11th tradition. Dr. Bob in the good old timers said, when one drunk is anonymous from another drunk, that's a violation of the 11th tradition. He went on to say that anonymity is spiritually inspired and secrecy is feared inspired. I mean, God forbid, 3 o'clock in the morning, you feel like drinking, you're going to call information? Yeah, I'd like to have John the Brick's phone number. <laughs> or you want to go visit one of these beloved old-timers? Yeah, I'm here to see Frank the Fox. I mean, <laughs> God bless you. Now, I need to tell you a true story. This happened less than a month ago. I'm in my home group, and I actually chaired a meeting, and it's been a while since I chaired a meeting. So I chaired a meeting for the month of June, the Thursday night meeting. I introduced myself. I always use my full name. I actually called on this woman. You know, she had her hand up. I recognized her, you know, halfway through the meeting. After the meeting, she came up to me. I never saw this woman in my life. She came up to me afterwards, and she said, listen. She said, were your grandparents Bob and Libby Coyle? Now, my grandparents have been long dead. And I looked at her. I was really, I never saw this woman in my life. I said, yes, they were. She said, how old are you? So that's kind of personal. How old are you? <laughs> <laughs> she said, I'm your cousin. Her father, Joe, and my grandmother were brothers and sisters. She was my second cousin. She was sober two years and ten months. I remember that because she said it about four times during her share. Two years and ten months. I never met her in my life. Forty-nine years old she is. I never met her in my life. Because I used my full name and not walks and on, she came up. I remember it was Thursday night, and afterwards we celebrate for anniversaries. We take them out to Chinatown. And so she sat next to me, and I actually called my dad from Chinatown. I said, Dad, I'm sitting here next to Maureen. And I, you know, Maureen Harrison. And my dad, and my dad hasn't seen her and spoke to her in years. And so she, her and my dad, who are first cousins, were on the phone chatting, and I have since had her over to family. This happened on less than a month ago in my home group. One of the benefits of using my full name. I've been very involved in service back home in Area 59, and we use our full name. However, I have no right whatsoever to break your anonymity. If you choose not to use your full name, I respect that. That's your decision, and that's not for me to violate, you know. So uh, back to the meeting, off the soapbox, I looked this guy dead in the eyes, and my name is Bobby Coyle. I'm an alcoholic. He nodded. He recognized me. So at the end of the meeting, when I got, well, at the end of my talk, when I got done, see, I was always told about making amends is much more than saying I'm sorry, because for me, I'm sorry are two words that don't mean squat. Making amends is about righting the wrong. And for me, financial amends are the easiest. I can go in my pocket and I can pay you, or if it's a significant amount of money, I go on a payment plan. But what about the emotional damage or the psychological damage? How do I make amends for that? I was told that I sit down and have conversations with people, but besides apologize for my behavior, 
the important thing is not to exhibit that behavior again. You know, like when I sat down with my brothers or my dad, you know, uh, from that point on, I assumed the role that I gave up before. I become a brother. I become a son again. So I sat down. I told this guy, I figured if I publicly humiliate the guy, the least I could do is to men make amends to him publicly. It wasn't the grandstand. And I told the group what I did to him. You know what? After the meeting, he came up and he hugged me. And it was a credible experience. Because first of all, when I said my full name, he smiled and then he recognized me, you know. But then he came up and he hugged me afterwards and we started talking. I said, Bob, I said, I haven't seen you in years. How are you doing? He said, Bobby, I'm sober. Three years in Alcoholics Anonymous. Now the arrogance creeps back in because everybody in Philadelphia knows me. I'm not saying they like me. They know me. I've been involved in service, you know, but at least they know me. And I'd never seen this guy before. Now I need to tell you, I live in South Philadelphia. He lives in the Roxborough section, which is like Northwest Philly. This meeting we're at is 11 in Rockland. It's in North Philadelphia. It's a meeting that he and I would normally not attend. So I start, I start talking. I said, what brings you here? He said, Bobby, I was slipping through the meeting directory tonight. And, I, and for some reason, this meeting jumped out at me. I just want to attend a different meeting. Now, I need to tell you, our meeting directory is almost 80 pages. We have 1,600 meetings a week in Philadelphia. And he said, for some reason, this meeting jumped out at me. This is a meeting that neither he or I have ever attended before. I am a firm believer that my God put that guy in my path. And I had two options. I could do what I did, or I could do what I always did. <laughs> See, the nice thing about having eight siblings in a 10-year span, there's always close resemblance. And people would come up to me and say, hey, USOB, I remember you. I said, no, no, you, you're confused. You're talking about my brother Brian or my brother Sean, not me. <laughs> and I had to make amends to my brothers because, you know, I know you're a cool, I just don't know which one you are. <laughs> but I had to make amends to my brothers, too, you know. So, but uh, that was crazy. Another experience on the ninth step, my home group for a while was the Stepping Stones group in Philadelphia. I was at a business meeting one Sunday. I made a motion. It was definitely for the betterment of AA. I know because I I made it. It had to be. <laughs> and an unusual thing happened I never saw happen before or since. Every motion gets seconded, even as crazy as it is. Always, you always get seconded because you feel got bad for the guys. All right, I know it's not going nowhere. I'll give them a second. <laughs> my motion doesn't get seconded, which is unbelievable because my boy Freddie's in the room. I'm actually looking at him. I'm giving him the eye like, hey, Freddie, get the hand up. <laughs> and he doesn't get the hand up. I can't believe it. My motion goes down in flames. I mean, and it's unbelievable because we're boys. Like, we're from the neighborhood. Like, you do, you know, there's certain rules. It's warped that they are. They're neighborhood rules. Everyone knows. First of all, you can't date anybody else's ex. Everyone, you just don't do that. That's not right. <laughs> Secondly, you always got your boys back. Right, wrong, or indifferent, you always got his back. Even if you got beat up, that was, you could deal with that later with him, but you always had your boys back. And I can't believe he did not second it. I'm giving him the eye, too. Like, he couldn't deny it. <laughs> I come to the meeting, I say, there'd be four or five minutes in there, I would completely ignore them. I would say, hi to the other three guys, you know. I was at work one day, one of my co-workers came up to me, and who was sober in the program, he comes up to me, he said, Bobby, Freddie Wheels is outside, he wanted to take, her, take care of some sort of business. I peeked out the window, I saw him in a, sitting in his car, I said, tell him, to, tell him to take his fat ass down to City Hall, he can't do that here. A few weeks later, that same co-worker called me up, he said, Bobby, he said, Freddie Wheels died last night. And he said, the reason I'm calling you is because he always spoke so highly of you. Now, here he was, was a friend of mine. And as God is my witness, I cannot tell you what that motion was about. That's how petty it was. This was a guy that was put in my path many, many times. I had many opportunities to make amends to him, and I chose not to. And the moment that, that my co-worker told me is because, Bobby, he always spoke so highly of you. I thought of that yay day, and I've been praying for Freddie ever since. So that's two experiences on the ninth step. See, that key word is wherever possible. I always thought that said whenever possible. You know, whenever's time, right? Wherever's place. And for me, it's never the right time because I'm too busy, easy, doesn't it? You know? <laughs> the 10th step is nothing but 4 through 9 on a regular basis. Now, if I'm going to stand up here and tell you I do a 10th step, that's not true. But I'm pretty good with it, you know? Four, five, six times a week, you know? Sometimes two or three times a week. And it never fails me because when I don't practice these principles, I always pay the price. And I always say, well, no one else knows. If I'm not doing the 10th step, that's not true either. Because when I'm not practicing these principles, I operate in nitwit mode. Should you cross my path in nitwit mode, you too are affected, you know? <laughs> and you know what? It's funny because, like I said earlier, you, you can't miss what you never had. I never missed a peace of mind since I never had it. But now I do. I have a peace of mind. And I don't like living in that sanity. In fact, to be honest, confrontation, all that other stuff, I get uncomfortable with. Now, don't get me wrong. I can get into it real quickly. But I hate to do that. You know, I, I like peace of mind. I don't like to be caught up in that insanity. So it's funny because most of the time I'm able to laugh at myself, which, which is truly a gift.
And a couple of our speakers alluded to it. I think laughter is God's music and alcohol synonymous. And I was incapable of doing that. But, you know, now when I get jammed up, it's usually is my fault. I mean, I don't even need to take a formal 10 step right away. I can catch myself. Well, wow, you really screwed up there, didn't you, pal? So, but that's the nice thing about it. I now know what I need to do to get back on the beam should I get knocked off the beam. And that's what the 10 step is for me. The 11 step through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact with God. I pray and meditate on a daily basis. Now, I don't want to tell anybody how I pray and meditate for the one reason only. I don't want to offend anybody. You know, uh, up to this point, I've been giving you my experience. I'm about to give you my opinion. I very rarely do that. When I do, I always qualify it with. I think that's what the hospitality room's for, the opinions. But from the podium, it's important. <laughs> but I'm about to give you my opinion. This is, I am glad, this is where I believe Alcoholics Anonymous is so successful. Because it, you guys have given me the freedom to pray and meditate in a way in which I am comfortable. I no longer pray and meditate the way I was taught as a kid, and that's okay, because the, my problem wasn't the church. The church wasn't the problem. God wasn't the problem. You know, my mom wasn't the problem. My mom was just a sick woman. You know, uh, it wasn't the Air Force. It wasn't the police department. It wasn't my neighborhood. The problem was Bobby Coyle. It was me. I was the problem long before I picked up a drink. I guarantee you, I was definitely the problem when I drank. When I put the bulls and the other stuff down, I was still the problem. I tried a couple things over the years, and I'm glad that Alcoholics Anonymous gave me the freedom, even though our literature gives us real good suggestions. But I, I believe it is successful because it gave me the freedom to pray and meditate, at, at least to find a way to pray and meditate in which I am comfortable. Because if there were only one way to pray and meditate, I guarantee you, you would have a different speaker this evening. I would not be here. So... But the most important part of that, uh, that 11th step, you know, is, you know, I pray for his knowledge of his will for us. Like, I don't pray, you know, please let the eagles cover, uh, even though I don't pray. <laughs> even though I don't gamble anymore, but I mean, I don't pray for that, you know. You know I, I, I don't do those things, you know. I, uh, you know, I pray for his knowledge of will and for, and for the power to carry that out. The 12th step, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. I did the steps. I had that spiritual awakening. Now, I haven't seen any burning bushes or lightning bolts or I haven't heard voices from above. In fact, it's been a few years since I heard any voices at all, and I'm truly grateful for that. <laughs> but I ha I've had that change of attitude. That's what I have. I'm not the same man that I was almost 19 years ago, you know. And, and I'm glad I'm not because, I, you know what, I'm not the same guy that I was four years ago. Because of my practice of spiritual principles, they're always talking about growth, you know. But the most important part of that 12 step is to practice these principles in all my affairs. I'm not only in AA an hour and a half a day. What about the other 22 and a half hours? What about the time on the job or the time in my neighborhood where it's tough to practice these principles? I can sound real good in a meeting, quote the literature, sound like the second come on Bill Wilson, but if I'm out there in the neighborhood doing slimy things, then, you know, I'm not practicing these principles in all my affairs. You know? And the 12 step is important. In our preamble, which is nothing but a condensed version of traditions, really, uh, you know, and the preamble says our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. If I'm only staying sober and not helping other alcoholics, that's half measures, and half measures avail us nothing. And the 12 step comes in many forms and fashions. You guys, this committee, they're doing beautiful 12 step work. That's what this conference is about. You know, there's some of us who have some time on our hands and we can get involved in more areas, like, like the area, the general service or get involved in a central office. I get uncomfortable when people say that's about politics. That has not been my experience. In fact, my experience, those people in that type of service are some of the most selfless people I've ever met, you know? We have various 12-step committees, you know? Uh, I know prisons, corrections aren't for everybody, but I'll share my experience with corrections. I remember a number of years ago, my sponsor called me up. He said, Bobby, they we're taking you up to Holmesburg, which is the prison in Philadelphia that's since been closed. It's a Monday night, and, you know, and I said, I'm not going up there. He said, yes, sure. I said, no, I'm not. He said, yes, sure. I said, okay. <laughs> See, I didn't think I could go up there because, because of what I did for a living. I didn't, you know, I thought that my story wasn't, you know, well, these guys just wouldn't be interested. I thought I would have to use profanity. I thought I would need to embellish my experiences. He said, Bobby, they don't care what the hell you did for a living. You know, you got a message of hope. That's what they want to hear. So I remember this it was a few weeks out. So that Friday, I realized... The Eagles were playing the Cowboys on Monday Night Football. I definitely couldn't go. So I called him up, and I told him, right? He said, Bobby, you gave me your word. He said, that's a commitment. He said, besides, if you pick up a drink, I don't think Ron Jaworski is going to 12-step your ass. And he hung up on me. So I go meet him, right? 
I go meet them, and uh, we have dinner. We drive up to the jail. We go through the whole process of getting buzzed in, leaving our valuables and stuff like that. We go to the meeting. No one shows up. They're all on the block watching the game. <laughs> then when I leave, I make some sort of smart out remark to the CEO on the gate, like, I guess you're transferring all your alcoholics upstate. He didn't know what the hell I was talking about. So I'm in the car going down 95, trying to get the game on the radio. Listen, he wants to talk. I said, oh, please shut up. I'm trying to listen to the game here. And then he picks up on it. He said, you don't get it, you selfish SOB. We were here just in case they showed up. We are responsible for the effort, not the outcome. He says, listen, we hung out tonight four or five hours. We had a nice dinner, nice conversation. And you'll go home and you'll catch the last quarter. That's all that's so important. And I said, okay, and he was right, you know. But I know prisons aren't for everybody, you know. But there's other types of 12-step work. You know, there's a, you know, public information going to health fairs and things like that and telling people about Alcoholics Anonymous, their CPC. That's not PCP, that's CPC. <laughs> Cooperation with professional community, taking uh, professional students to open AA meetings. So one day when they're in their practice, whether as physicians or nurses or ministers, they'll know about Alcoholics Anonymous. They'll know how to send one of their parishioners or, or patients. I mean, there's some great work. You know, there's people who, who work behind the scenes, make coffee, good 12-step work, you know. There's some of us who do great work organizing events and balancing checkbooks. Then there's some of us who should never, ever be allowed near a checkbook, you know. <laughs> I am a firm believer that every person in this room has a gift. It may be different than the person sitting next to you, but it's your gift. You need to find out what that is. You know, because we have a statement, I am responsible. When anyone, anywhere, reaches out for help, I want the hand of AA to be there for that. I'm responsible. I can't worry about what you're doing. I got involved in service, and I learned about the traditions, and I love the traditions. The traditions are to the groups, what the steps are to the individuals. The steps are how it works, and the traditions are why it works, and the whole history behind that. I mean, that's just fascinating stuff. I got involved in service in 1993. I was uh, I became elected. I was the alternate delegate from my area, Area 59. I was going to be the youngest delegate ever to the General Service Conference. Who that delegate was and how old they were, I have no idea. I have since found out. It was a friend of mine from Michigan. I think she was 24 when she was the delegate. But it was I was that was aspirations. Uh, be, be careful of an alcoholic with aspirations. You know? <laughs> so uh, I was going to. I became the alternate delegate and. Uh, I was training, I was always a runner, and I wanted to run Boston. And to run the Boston Marathon, you need to qualify. I mean, they have a lottery for a few spots, but I want to uh, need to qualify. So I was actually training to do the Marine Corps Marathon. And I was, uh, you know, running. And one day, you know, I took a stumble, and I kind of hurt my shoulder. And I had this pain for a while. So I, I went to get a doctor to go get it checked out. I got diagnosed with lung cancer. I never smoked in my life. I'm a little reefer for a short period of time, but that don't count. So I went to go get a second opinion, and it got confirmed. I couldn't believe it. I was floored. Yeah, I mean, I'm sober for a number of years. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in grad school. I mean, I'm, I'm running. I'm, I'm in good shape. I mean, I got things to do. And I remember talking to my sponsor, who ironically would die three years later of lung, uh, lung cancer. He wasn't diagnosed yet. He said, Bobby, what the hell you want to do about it? So I went through treatment. You know, I bounced back. You know, and then I got really sick. Uh, I actually had surgery. I had the lower left lobe of my lung removed. And uh, I was in the hospital for quite some time. And after I got out of the hospital, I was laid up in my house. And I couldn't make meetings. And I was always a meeting maker. Hell, with 1,600 meetings a week, there's no reason not to make meetings, you know. And I, was, I always made meetings. And I couldn't make meetings. I was laid up in my house. And people start coming to my house to carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm just not talking about my friends. I'm talking about people that I may have met once at the assembly where I'd never met at all, and somebody was coming to bring friends. I mean, you're looking at a liar, a thief, and cheat. I took from everyone. The only thing I gave was heartache and misery, and people came, came to my house to carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I'm a firm believer that my doctors did a pretty good job, but it was the prayers of Alcoholics Anonymous that helped save me. And I've been back and forth. You know, it's been two and a half years since I had any treatment, and I kind of glow with dark, uh, you know, <laughs> gained, a, gained a couple pounds. It's all in my belly. You know, I, I tell you, I've had a little difficulty up here, you know, just not the altitude, was catching my breath, you know. But, uh, uh, but you know what, when I got diagnosed, you know, I had to give up my position as the, the, the alternate uh, delegate. I, I just, you know, ego, I want to hold on to it, but the truth was I didn't have the strength to do the job. And I gave it up and somebody else did the job and they did a bang up job. When I got diagnosed, when I got that second diagnosis, I don't want you to think I handled this well because I didn't. You know, <laughs> Actually, the first thing happened, I actually got sick. 
when I got the second day. But after that, after it got confirmed, uh, I didn't handle this well. I went into a little funk, and, uh, you know, it, it took me a while. Even though I thought I had an excuse to go out and, and get loaded, I didn't have a reason to go out and get loaded. Because at this, at this point in my life, I've been to thousands of meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. I saw some men and women go through some terrible things through no fault of their own, and they got through it without picking up a drink. Life on life terms, you know? So, so I got through it, you know? I was in Mexico about 16, 17 years ago. I thought I could speak Spanish. Those poor people probably still figuring out what the hell I said. I figured because all those years I worked in the barrio, my Spanish consisted of like, dame pistola, which means give me your gun. You know, so I'm in this AA meeting. I'm the only English-speaking person in the room, and I start speaking Spanish. And these poor people looking at me, figuring out what the hell I said. So I switch over to English, you know, and they still don't know what I said. But you know what? Language of the heart. At the end of the meeting, I can tell who the old timer was by the serenity in their face, and I can tell who the new guy was by the pain in their face. Language of the heart. They came up and they hugged me. It was an incredible experience. You know, I, I can go on. I mean, I just, Alcoholics Anonymous is just really, it's just an incredible way of life. You know, uh, I, I alluded a couple times uh, about being a mummer. And I always say this for the end because when I said that earlier, I saw a couple of you guys talking, what the hell's a mummer? Uh, there are a few people here from the Philadelphia area. I guess they're out here in the Witness Protection Program. <laughs> The marshals will be here tomorrow, moving you. <laughs> they know the mummers. Uh, it's a parade we do in Philadelphia. It's on. Don it's done on New Year's Day. It is the longest continuous parade in the country. Now the Mardi Gras is a three-day deal, right uh, uh, before the start of Lent, but um, they break it up. It's like a few hours here, a few hours there. But the Mardi Gras, I mean, uh, the mummers parade. Uh, it's New Year's Day. It's about 30,000 of us. It's about 12, 13 hours long in the cold, bitter cold, with men with sequins, feathers, and makeup. I've done a fist step. I, I mean, I actually wore a pink shirt last night. I mean, I, I have no problems. But you know what? Uh, we, we are not politically correct. If you're thin skinned, God bless you. We, we spoof everybody. You know, uh, we're irreverent, and, uh, but it's a great time. What it is, it's like a combination of the Mardi Gras and the full Monty. A lot of cross-dressing going on. It's, just, it's a drunk fest. It's a nuts. So I'm in a midnight meeting 16 years ago, and I tell you, midnight meetings are my favorite meetings. Midnight meetings are either the most spiritual or the most bizarre. Very little middle ground. I mean, you're talking guys with capes and ray guns, and then people working second shifts trying to stay sober. I just love midnight meetings, you know? So I'm at this midnight meeting. I'm telling my story that I'm a lifelong mummer. Kid came up to me here to and says, listen, would you be interested in marching the parade this year? I said, you're out of your mind. People placing the things. I got no business being down there. He said, you don't understand. He said, we're starting a group of sober mummers. And a sober mummer is an oxymoron. <laughs> so we start this group. Actually, the name of our brigade is the 12 Steppers New Year's Brigade. And this past year, I am the last guy left, the original guy. Last year on New Year's Day was my 15th year up the street with the New Year's Brigade, the 12 Steppers. Several years ago, I got elect elected captain of the brigade, which is a prestigious honor. <laughs> For all the other brigades, the captain's sole responsibility is to get the beer truck. We do something a little bit different for the 12 steppers. I just got to march in my 37th parade. My f grandfather had dropped dead playing the alto sax on the corner of Broad in Washington and South Philadelphia on New Year's Day in 1981. And the band went on, you know, and uh, it, I'm able to do something that was a big part of my family's history, and I can do it. See, the best thing about doing things sober is you, you can have great fun at it, you can remember it, you know, and that uh, you're good at it, you know, it's really a great time. See, one of my favorite sayings in the big book says, we absolutely insist on enjoying life. If the newcomer can see no joy in our existence, they wouldn't want it. Now, obviously, I just paraphrase that. I'll never be as eloquent as Bill Wilson, but you get the idea. So if you're new and think that you've got to wear the hair shirt and beat yourself and your life is over, you're greatly mistaken. Your life is just starting, you know. It's a wonderful way of life. But that's, that particular passage comes after taking the action steps, you know? Like, you can't play your way to softball to recovery, you know? You can't dance your way to recovery. You know, and the mummers, we can't strut our way to recovery. <laughs> now, mummers actually, uh, it's actually taken from the Greek god of ridicule, who was mummus. So that was a little antiquity there for you. That's where the word mummers derive from. But I'm telling you, if you can go up Broad Street on New Year's Day sober, 
Anything's possible. <laughs> now, after, Ma after Broad Street, actually, the real parade is actually on 2 Street. We go down 2nd Street afterwards, and that's really nuts. And my rule of thumb, I usually stay until I see the first fist fight. After I first uh, fight, then it's time for me to go home. But it's a great time. So uh, if you're new, I wish you well. I don't want to wish you luck, because luck ain't got nothing to do with it. You know, I don't want you to think like recovery is like a lottery and the wheel spins on you and today's your day to drink. That's nonsense. People say, I, I know people who did the steps and they still drank. That's nonsense too. Because the 12th step doesn't say go out and buy a fifth. You know, in fact, we have a guarantee in our book that tells us when all else fails, nothing will ensure us from picking up a drink than rigorous work with other alcoholics. You know, so you can't do the steps and pick up a drink again. You know, it, it's just nonsense. It's not true. But, you know, and it has nothing to do with time. You know, I know people sober a number of years are crazy with bed bugs, and, you know, I just know so guys that are sober, you know, not as long and that have quality of life, you know. But the way it works is you get yourself a home group. You get yourself a sponsor. Your sponsor should have done the steps. If your sponsor has, done this, has not done the steps, he or she has no business sponsoring you. How do you find out they did the steps? No question there. You ask them. You're either going to hear two things, yes or no. If the person replies yes, that's your guy or gal. If they say no, you move on. You know, I always use the analogy, uh, you know, because the building trades are back home. I grew up in a neighborhood where the goal was to get a union book. It didn't matter what building trade, but you got yourself a book. And if you didn't get yourself a book, you became a cop, a fireman, you know, or whatever the deal was. But you got yourself a book. Now, in the building trades, we even have different, you know, the iron workers are up here, electricians, carpenters are always down there, carpenters are always scabs, always crossing picket lines. So whatever, but you get yourself a union. You get yourself a book. And the deal is, once you're an apprentice, you go to school and you work for four years and then you become a journeyman, right? And then you become a journeyman. Well, that's the same thing in recovery. If you're new, you're an apprentice. You get yourself a journeyman, the sponsor, who has experienced the 12 steps. The sponsor takes you on that journey. You get your experience. You're no longer an apprentice. You become a journeyman. And then you get an apprentice yourself. That's the way it works. I mean, I loved Jerry's readings tonight. I, it was a fantastic reading. I mean, what came 70-some years ago, a, a meeting between new men, two men, now throughout the world in over 134 countries. It's incredible. I really believe that both those guys were divinely inspired. It's a wonderful way of life. I'm going to finish up right now uh, what's going on now to me. I still work for the city of Philadelphia. I'm no longer a police officer. Uh, so for those who have warrants, please relax. <laughs> we do have computers. Straighten that stuff out. I tell you, seriously. When you turn yourself in, you, you're dealing from a position of strength. If we pull you over and run you through the computer and uh, we, we pinch you, you know, you, you no longer have credibility. So take this, take care of that stuff. We, you know, you'll be amazed. I know I, you may be fearful, but take care of it. Uh, you'll be amazed how it works out. I still work for the city. I, um, uh, I actually do the EAP work now for the city. I went back to grad school. I, I got an MSW from the University of Pennsylvania. I got my MSW from an Ivy League school. Not bad for a little old dirt ball from the neighborhood. Uh, what happened to that kid on the bike? Uh, nothing happened to him. You know the old saying, God takes care of drunks, fools, and kids? Well, the, the trifecta happened that day. Yeah. The kid who I did not know, but I actually, my family was friends with his family. Uh, the kid wasn't hurt seriously at all. And it's a good thing that he wasn't, because if he was, uh, that could have changed the, changed the dynamics of everything, and who knows if I've been here today. Uh, my mother, unfortunately, lost her life that day. I walked out of the house. And... Uh, I got to make amends to my father. I was sober almost five, almost five years, and I sat down and I talked to my dad, and I told him exactly what happened. You know what? My dad hugged me. He forgave me. He said, Bobby, that's all right, Mom. He was just a sick woman, you know? So I got to make amends, but I also got to send my father back to Ireland not that long ago. And uh, so it was just a, just another way to try to right the wrong, you know? And to, today, my father is probably one of my best friends. I was always embarrassed about my dad growing up because, like I said, I, blew, I grew up in a blue-collar ethnic neighborhood. My father was actually an English professor at a Jesuit university before getting involved in politics. And all the other guys in the neighborhood, their fathers were writers, but uh, they wrote book. They took numbers. <laughs> uh, that's what I wanted my dad to do. I thought my dad was, you know, kind of a square and, you know, you know, stressing education. And, you know, I just found out, you know, my dad never ran on my mom. And after my mom died, he, you know, he made a great deal of sacrifice to, uh, to give us all fine education. I just found out that, you know, my dad was a man of principles and ethics and just a truly decent human being. And if I turn out to be half the guy that my father ever is, that I'll be okay. My father never had a drink in his life. 
The night before I left for basic training, we went to a bar and he ordered two beers. And I was amazed. I could not believe it. And I could not drink my beer. I felt uncomfortable. My father didn't take a sip either. But I now know that he was trying to bond with me. I couldn't wait to get back to the neighborhood. The guys in the neighborhood were going to do a party for me. Here I am, turning down a free beer because I couldn't work, couldn't drink my father, you know. And uh, he still doesn't drink, and neither do I, but I can bond with him in other ways. It's a wonderful way of life. I, it really is. I wish you well. I don't wish you luck. And one last thing, I'm not the poster boy of Alcoholics Anonymous. I invite you to come live with me for a week. See what type of guy that I am. I make mistakes. But making mistakes doesn't get me drunk. It's not learning from those mistakes or justifying those mistakes or even worse, defending those mistakes. That will lead to the arrogance that will get me drunk. I'm just a regular guy from the neighborhood trying to do the right thing. And for the most part, I'm pretty good. And for those other days when I fall short, I have a program that allows me to get back on the beam and try to treat people with dignity and respect. And that's all I got. Thanks for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.